Antonia, darling, how do you feel about the natural hair movement? How do you feel about the natural hair movement since it doesn't seem like your hair is so natural right now? Yeah. How do you feel about it? Um, can I have the mic? Oh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> I know, I don't need this. I'm not a supreme. <laughs> All right. Um, is it working? Is it all right, well, um, well, my hair is, is natural under this. Um, I, uh, I, I, pers I love the, the natural hair movement because it is expanding the definition of beauty. Um, and for so long, it's been so narrowly defined. Um, in my hair world, I do believe that curly hair and straight hair can coexist, even on the same person. Um, so yesterday I was curly, today I'm straight. That's a, it's my prerogative. Um, and I think that that's, that's one thing that I like, especially about the black hair community. We have that choice. Um, I think one of the things that the natural hair movement is making us realize is that even without this hair, um, we are beautiful. Um, so that's a, a strong part of the movement that I, des I definitely embrace. Um, and I'm enjoying experimenting by way of all the videos that are out there um, with all the different hairstyles and learning what my hair can do. And also, well, one more question for you. What is it you hope to gain? Because people misconstrued your intentions yeah. from the very beginning. I know this because I got a lot of tweets <laughs> and a lot of people like, you know what I'm talking about? Like, no, I know, I can't explain what's happening. What was your goal? What was your um, goal? Well, there, there was, to be honest, there was no, no goal. Um, it was an exploration. Um, so when you, I guess if, if I were to say that there were a goal, the, the goal would be to learn something. Um, I initially wanted to understand why people had the curiosity. Because um, everyone would just say, oh, I'm just curious, I'm just curious, it's innocent curiosity, but why are you curious? Um, and for so long, I've been having that conversation just with other black women who have the same issue. Um, so I wanted to use this as an opportunity to hear the other side. Um, that didn't actually happen. <laughs> we got a little bit of it, um, but we heard more of our side. Um, and I heard more of how other people feel about it and other people's um, experience with this particular issue because everyone else, everyone has a different kind of encounter. Um, the ones where, that are, are touched without permission, that's intense. Um, I luckily have an experience that I, I usually get asked. Um, so it's just been interesting to see the various levels of the, the conversation um, as well as how people respond to it. Let's talk, just by a show of hands, how many people have had their hair touched without permission? Touched without permission, okay. Okay, okay, so see, this happens to everybody. There's some people in here who are not black people. They get their hair touched without permission. Why is it so much worse for us, Michaela? Why is it different? Um, first, thank you for, um, mm -hmm. for continuing to interrogate, because that's really, I think, what, how I saw the, the piece, and I saw this kind of a, um, performance art space and and from that you don't want as you said you it's not about making people feel comfortable you want to interrogate you want to make this happen right you want to make things happen so thank you for that and thank you who, who's it from the Pantene family in here thank you <laughs> um, because often these kind of conversations um, need sponsors and platforms and spaces outside of our own, you know, beauty parlors and homes. And I think that's part of this sort of revolution. Have, you know, you were saying that this idea that we have these free um, social media and digital media has changed the game. And black girls have taken over Twitter. <laughs> They've taken over the. They. They. You know, Julie was talking about that. Like she's like, black Twitter will rise. <laughs> And because no one's, you know, so no one's um, policing our conversation. And so, and we've been so policed, and our bodies have been so policed, and our sense of expression has been so policed. And why, why I think our hair, back to your question, why our hair, why it's so sensitive is because it is one of those free spaces where we were able to express ourselves and our creativity, whether it, it is political or whether we just think it's cute. or. This is our this is our space, and when we when you've been rendered invisible or a menace, because that's kind of how a lot of it has been placed, that you're either not there or you're a menace. Um, so you, you you enter the world differently, and so and it happens a lot in clubs, <laughs> right? A part, like especially in mixed spaces, yeah. people have a few cocktails. Oh, it's okay, y'all have. <laughs> 
and 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 it's like it's it's weird. It is kind of the same as you know. Your, doesn't it happen a lot in the club? I mean, it does happen on the street, but the actual going in is when that some of those boundaries are taken away. And I remember, because I mean, my hair has been like this since 1990, um, and and it was, and it's because I I became pregnant, and there are no there are no FDA regulations around relaxers, so no, my doctor couldn't tell me whether I would experience any neurological damage as a result of, because I used to run a relaxer through my head because it was textured. It was like, <laughs> like I wanted to texturize it. So, so I never made my hair bone straight, but you know, it was not, I said 90, y'all. So, <laughs> the thing, you know, activated. But, um, but they, there's no research. That means that we didn't matter. That's what it meant to me because yeah. my doctor had tons around bleaching and permanence, which were, when white women want curly hair and they put them in those rods, mm -hmm. tons of research, none for us. So I just didn't want to, mm -hmm. so it wasn't like I knew freedom hair let's, was free. Let's talk about that. that though, because people, like what we were talking about too, is that when a white woman or a woman, Asian woman, anybody, wears their hair naturally, it's not political. But when Michaela Angela Davis ends up on, you know, Fox News or CNN or something like that, it's automatically political because she's wearing her hair the way that it comes out in the shower, the way that it was coming out of her scalp when she was born. Why is it that our natural way is political? Why can't it? Why is that the uh, that? Why is that the label that people put on? Do, do people put that label on you? Uh, off the bat? Well, it's changing, right? I think. It, how old are you? Twenty-four. Okay, so. <laughs> Okay, I could be your mama. <laughs> <laughs> no, my daughter's 22, and she has a totally different. I think it is, you know, you if you put the Angela Davis next to me, she would have one experience. I'm having one experience. Hopefully, we're combing out the naps, right? <laughs> so for your children, it won't be such a nappy situation. That's what I, what I hope. But our history is such, like that's our experience is such that the otherness that we have experienced and now it's like it's wonderful we have all these choices of products and tools but when you only have pink lotion and a hot comb <laughs> no for real like growing up you i had you had grease and a comb and like i said it was torture so we and then you had to like crawl at the bottom of the shelf to get your stuff or you had to go into the hood dusty you know you were, yeah you were still like families rolling up in the hood just like you couldn't get there shampoo so, so all those are dehumanizing experiences. Yeah. That, you so see, that's you know there's a murmur? It's because, well, let's think about this. Black women, out of all the people on earth, in America, spend more money than anybody else mm -hmm. on hair care products. Like, if y'all stop buying stuff, everyone will be bankrupt, okay? <laughs> Forget the government shutdown, all right? You all can call us, like, a boycott that no one has ever seen before. But on the front lines of this, okay, everybody else, we can talk about it, but someone had to live it. That was Andrea. Andrea, tell me. Oh, Autumn, my bad. <laughs> Your name is not Andrea. Your name is Autumn. And I apologize. So my main reason for being a part of this basically was because everyone's hair journey is different. Mine basically started because my dad is from Ireland, my mom is from Guyana. So I am a mixed race child. So being raised up, I had a sister that's 100% black. Her hair type was completely different from mine. So my mother wasn't used to having a biracial child who had a hair texture like mine so being raised up my mom was like all right well let me just fall into the regular you know thing of giving my child a perm when i, I went to a predominantly white school so me seeing all of these girls with beautiful straight hair and mine i'd be afraid to go in the rain like oh god you don't want to know what this thing's going to look like if it gets wet so I kind of just wanted to be like everyone else. I wanted to be the norm. So me expressing those concerns to my mom, she was like, all right, let me give you a perm like your sister. So growing up, that's what I had. It ended up cutting out my hair. I ended up regretting it completely. Two years ago, I completely cut my hair off. I went in the bathroom, cut it off with craft scissors. I thought I would feel this like empowerment, like, yes, I finally feel it. I didn't. I hated it. I hated how short my hair was. I felt ugly. It, it's kind of like society, the stigma that they give is that automatically 
you should have straight, beautiful, flowing hair. The wind should be blowing in it automatically. Hell no. If I put my hair in a ponytail, I take the, the scrunchie out, my hair is staying right there. <laughs> okay? So it's kind of like I didn't feel that. So I started with, like, I started making um, natural hair clip-ins because I felt so ugly. I worked at a bar. It's like sexuality comes from your hair being long and luxurious. Especially in black men, they don't want no short hair woman. They really don't. They'll always be like, okay, well, you know, if your sh- if your hair looks good short like Harry like Halle Berry, then you okay. But if your hair looks short like a slave, you're not. No, that's how I felt. So me clipping in those natural hair clip-ins, it was like sexuality just being clipped into my head, and it took a while for me to be okay with my hair texture being the way that it is, me being okay with my hair not being straight when I go to the bar, for men to actually give me attention for my hair being the way that it is, that was so foreign to me. So to me, this exhibit, it gave me a different feeling. I I was in it for a different reason that maybe many of the other girls were in. It gave me a feeling of self, like, yes, my hair is okay. I felt good about it. So that's the main reason. How did you feel afterwards? Um, Afterward, okay, well, I was on the second day of the exhibit. So the first day, I don't feel like there were many protesters there with it. The second day, everyone was like, hell yeah, I'm coming out. We all, so I was like, oh, God. <laughs> so I didn't really know how to feel. It was, it was like I wasn't expecting that. To me, I was going there in my head to educate people who would normally come up to me. So the thing was, I felt like people thinking me being there was me giving the okay and the green light for everyone to come up and touch my hair. That's not okay. Although I was part of it on the you can touch my hair side, I still have my regulations and things like that to where I'm like, no, you can't touch my hair. So, I mean, I've been in, when I was in college, guys would go up to girls and they would bring a comb or a pencil or something like that. They would run it through the girl's hair and say, track check. So to me, it's like, Oh, no. Uh -uh. I don't pay enough for this hair. You're not going to do all of that in the nursery. (laughs) So, I mean, I felt like I was completely in it for a different reason. People of, you know, multi-ethnic backgrounds came up to me. A white woman came up to me, and a white woman that you would never, ever think would have biracial children came up to me, and she was like, this is my daughter. And I'm like, oh, my gosh. Like She's like, I don't know what to do with her hair. So to me, it was kind of like being back in my childhood and just being able to tell someone, you know, well, this is the best way to do, you know, embrace it, do this, do that. So to me, it was, it it was more of help. It was more of, you know, projecting myself back to my childhood and explaining and helping someone out that normally wouldn't know what to do with a biracial child's hair.